Right, I'm reading the near the end of the forward to um, Finney, the book of Finney Lives On. And I'll read right up until the first chapter starts. Okay. Right, page 12. The Word of God, the Word of God took first place in Finney's thinking and sermon preparation. He says on one occasion, I read nothing all that winter but my Bible. Constantly in the Word of God was he, so that his messages had the force of the flaming sword. Finney was constantly among the people to witness to them of God's saving grace and their need of the risen Christ of God in their lives. It is, oh, if it is true that Finney spent many years in private prayer, usually before daybreak, it is also true that most of his other non-preaching hours were spent among the people of the community, dealing with them regarding their souls. This, of course, made his preaching immensely practical and on occasions terrifyingly pointed. Finney always related his sermons to everyday life. Sermon building went on as he walked through the community and observed people in any number of situations which he would proceed to work into his preaching. His messages were a kind of pile driver technique they kept driving away at a point until it was definitely established in his hearers' thinking. Finney believed that preaching should be for a verdict, for an immediate verdict, and not simply for contemplation. He made abundantly clear that you may do whatever you wish concerning the message of God, that is, Accept it or reject it, but you will have to decide. The greatness of this man was always enhanced by his humanity. He was never too high in theological crowds, theological crowds to come down to the practical business of living. He believed that revival in the sense of a real stirring among God's people was based squarely upon certain unchanging principles and he was far too much of a realist to suppose that any amount of fancy religious talk or praying could take the place of ruthless honesty and sacrificial obedience. We could stand a few of his kind of people today. We could stand a few of his kind of people. We could stand a lot of his kind of people today. Dr. Edmund's study of the life of Finney came for him, as it did for me, out of great hunger of heart for re revival. If there is one thing his leadership has meant to the sons and daughters of Wheaton, apparently that's the university he's writing from, and to the angelical world at large, it is this constant yearning toward an almighty God and continual spirit-led obedience to his commands, his commands, God's commands, a process that takes many others along the way to revival with it. Dr. Edmund has captured all the atmosphere that surrounded the ministry of Finney and has woven his own charming style into a highly readable and exceedingly profitable book. May it be to his readers, as it has been to me, a source of great conviction and inspiration. Written by Forward, written by Robert A. Cook. I don't know who he is. But I will have to look him up now. Dear Jesus, you definitely will do that. He might have been a great, I don't know, theologian or 
we call them pasta or someone some god person great god person whether he be an author or whatever preacher right and we have a little i don't know what that's called but i will read it out <clears throat> come holy spirit come let thy bright beams arise dispel the darkness from our minds and open all our eyes revive our drooping faith our doubts and fears remove and kindle in our breast the flame of never dying love convince us of our sin then lead to jesus's blood and to our wandering view reveal the secret love of god to bind to cleanse the heart to sanctify the soul amen oh it doesn't say that it's, i'll read it again Design to cleanse the heart, to sanctify the soul, to pour fresh, fresh life on every part, and new create the whole. That one rhymed. Dwell therefore in our heart, our mind from bondage free. Then shall we know and praise and love the Father, Son, and Thee, the Holy Spirit. Thee. Okay, the setting of a story, page 15. In the early autumn of 1825, ah, the canal boat, what? Seneca chief, gaily bedecked and bearing a distinguished party on board. Oh, I think that's the name of the boat. Seneca chief. Okay, the guests of Governor DeWitt Clinton, ooh, Clinton, moved steadily through the New Erie Canal, Canal, <laughs> Canal, I think it's Canal, across New York State from the young and bustering, bustering. <laughs> from the young and blustering, port of a buffalo to the more austere and settled albany on the lordly hudson i think that's a river and then down that noble stream to the sea on the arrival of the seneca chief at the port of new york the governor with appropriate ceremonies poured a keg of lake erie water into the Atlantic to symbolize the newly established union between the Great Lakes of North America and the Seven Seas of the world. At long last, the Erie Canal had become a reality and because of it, the wilderness of central New York State would soon be transformed into flourishing villages and farms and a new ep epic an american expansion toward the setting sun would soon be underway through the new canal moved native americans from the eastern seaboard and immigrants from beyond the broad atlantic together with the products of eastern factories and western farms to cause American destiny to mount higher as it marched westward. westward. The Erie Canal constitutes a very apt symbol of the ministry of Charles Grandison Finney, who, in my opinion, is the most widely known and most successful American revivalist. His early ministry was largely in the area along the banks of the canal. canal. And frequently, he used the slow but steady means of transportation. Jesus. Slow. Oh, it must be the, uh, 
What are those? He used the slow but steady means of transportation made available by it. Must be like these theories, boats. Like the canal. Oh, what? Like the canal. He was a channel of blessing and usefulness, transforming the wilderness of American hearts until they blossomed there in the Rose of Sharon. It's beautiful. The rough places were made plain. The crooked was made straight. Farmers and woodsmen, merchants and lawyers were converted, all because a spirit-filled man brought the dynamic gospel of Christ to the new rural villages and cities along the canal, as well as eastward into New England and westward into the Ohio country. Just as a larger and better America was made possible socially and economically by the Erie Canal, just so a new America, just so a new America, spiritually speaking, was made by the Ministry of Finney. Just as the canal was a channel for American commerce and enterprise, so was Finney's life a channel for the river of God to bring saving grace, moral morality, integrity, sobriety, and godly sobriety even, and godliness to American life. So the significance of Finney's contribution to the spiritual life of America stands out clearly as one views the historical setting of his ministry. Before his day, there had come two mighty visitations of God's Spirit to America, known in history as the First and Second Awakenings. The first came in the 1740s to the colonies during the days of Jonathan Edwards, Gilbert Tennant, George Whitefield, might be pronounced Whitfield, I think, and others. And revival had strengthened and steeled colonial hearts for the fiery ordeal of the long French and Indian wars on the frontier and the revolution for American freedom. A second awakening, the second awakening, came at the turn of the 19th century. That would be the 1800s. When the young republic was beginning to feel its internal strength and external independence. In the day when principles of the new constitution were beginning to be applied to American life and Western expansion began to turn American eyes from European conflicts and ambitions, the spiritual life of America was threatened by the impact of English deism and French infidelity infidelity. Voltaire and Tom Paine were the heroes of American schoolboys who called each other by French names. As was done in the revolution against the Bourbons. Bourbons. Orthodoxy could not cope with insidious <laughs> insidious an insistent infidelity. Orthodoxy could not cope with insidious and insistent infidelity until revival came to America. To new to New England through the ministry of Timothy Dwight, president of Yale, and student of old Eli into the new west of Kentucky and Tennessee through Methodist circuit riders and Baptist exhort exhorters. Uh, exhorters. 
Okay. All right. Okay. Within a decade of the second awakening, all of American life had been lifted to new spiritual and moral heights. Amen. Hallelujah. Finney's half century, it doesn't say that. Finney's half century of revival ministry brought the dynamic of the gospel to a very needy America. The impact of the Second Awakening had decreased markedly by the time Finney appeared in the rural, rural areas of central New York. And in the third decade of the 19th century, third decade, oh yeah, <clears throat> 1830s, strident voices were heard in the land and strife seemed always imminent. American expansionism, not satisfied by the acquisition of the Louisiana, Louisiana Territory and Florida, was reaching west of, westward for Texas, California, and Oregon. By the Monroe Doctrine, the Americans had declared the Western Hemisphere, Western Hemisphere to be an area of particular interest to themselves, and apart from the power of politics of Europe, strong men with strong opinions stood in high places in American political life. Andrew Drac Jackson, sorry, Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, John C. Calhoun, sectional strife, sectional strife was on the increase. Sectional strife. Probably, what do you call it? Like segregation type? I don't I'm not sure. Okay. Sectional strife was on the increase with bitterness between the North, oh, yes, of course, North and South over the tariff, tariff, in the nullification position of South Carolina, okay, over the, the domination of American economic life by the United States Bank, and especially over the slavery issue, of course, slavery, slavery issue. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 had alarmed the aging Jefferson and his contemporaries, contemporaries as a fire bell in the night. Was he a president? I'm not sure. I need to look these things up. The Compromise did not, did not quell the fire on the frontier. William Lloyd Garrison, Wendell Phillips, and other abolitionists continued, ah, oh, uh, uh, abolitionists, I think, yeah, those are people against slavery, I think, back in the day, so those must have been all political men, folk, continued to stir the northern conscience and to anger southern conviction. The Wilmot Proviso greatly complicated and embittered the acquisition of Texas and territories gained in the Mexican War and the conflagration oh my goodness and the conflagration conflagration was not quenched by the compromise of eighteen hundred and fifty. The whole issue of slavery in the territories was raised to fevered heat fevered heat by the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 and the Dred Scott decision of 1857. Territories. The whole issue of slavery in the territories was raised to fevered heat. Okay. The Freeport Doctrine of Senator Douglas flouting the Dred Scott decision, flouting, okay, of 1857, and his debates with Lincoln, Lincoln, 
What if that's president? It's got to be President Lincoln. Way, way, way would be split irretrievably the Democratic Party. Whoa, it split the Demo irretrievably. Is in can't go back together again. The Democratic Party and made possible the election of Lincoln to the presidency in 1860. Well, so that was in 1858. Oh, 18 must have been. <clears throat> I'm just assuming. The days of impending crisis with the venality of partisan politics. Venally? Venally. Venality of partisan politics and vindictiveness. Or is that vindictive? Oh, vindictiveness of sectional strife. To which one must add the vulgarity of the frontier, yes, and the vice of growing cities, called loudly and imperatively for a prophet of God. Oh, wow, look at that. Oh, Jesus. Yes, Jesus, Heavenly Father. <laughs> Finney was, as it were, John the Baptist, emerging from the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord and to preach with the fire of the Holy Ghost, the urgency of repentance, sparing neither the, sparing neither the sophisticated Pharisees, the sophisticated Pharisees, in smug, respectable religion, nor the insatiable publicans, insatiable publicans, and greedy, grafting politics. <coughs> Finney was God's man for that day of strife and sinfulness. And sinfulness. The purpose... The purpose of this little volume is to re-evaluate re the revivalism of Finney and to show that it is decidedly applicable to modern America, modern world, modern everywhere. Today, Finney came to know the secret of revival and its strength. For the past several years, there has come to me and to many others deep burden of heart for return of revival days in America. I have read and reread with burning of heart the autobiography oh, and revival lectures of Finney and have come to the persuasion that, that to a large extent we do, not, we do not see revival. We do not see revival because we do not know its pattern nor the mighty moving of God's spirit, as did Finney. There are a few books packed with spiritual atomic power, as are the autobiography and lectures. They should be read and studied in the unabridged edition. Unabridged edition, what is that? Unedited? So, we, me, you, we shall get those autobiographies. We shall get, look for that book of um, Finney. Finney's autobiographies and his revival lectures out yourself if you want to study into this and maybe start revivals in your own town, your own country. Get people back to God, how we should be. 
myself, ourselves and all, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, is that it? Are we starting? No, no, there's, sorry, there's a little bit more. I think, how much more? Mm. Oh, a very little bit more. Right, it's a, it's a verse. <laughs> o Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, in, of the years, make known in wrath. Remember mercy. Oh, <clears throat> that's nice. Lord, and, and, and a bit of some more, I don't know if that's poetry. Some kind of litigious things. Lord, I hear of showers of blessing. Thou art scattering full and free. Showers the thirsty land refreshing. Let some portion fall on me. Oh, I think that's a long. Pass me not, O tender Saviour, save you. Let me love and cling to thee. I am longing for thy favour, whilst thou art calling, O call me. Call me. Pass me not, O mighty Spirit. Thou canst make the blind to see. Witnesser of Jesus' merit. Witnesser of Jesus' merit. Speak the word of power to me. Wow. Love of God so pure and changeless, blood of Christ so rich and free, grace of God so strong and boundless, magnify them all in me, even me. That's what it says, even me. Okay, right, so that's it. I'll stop this for now. And then we'll be starting the chapters. I think that's the first chapter. Part one. Oh, Interesting. Okay, right, bye.